It's a pleasure again to be speaking at one of the At The Limits meetings. And thank you very much to Derek and John for inviting me. The picture on my first slide, top right-hand corner, is not, alas, my own institution, but takes me back to the last time I was at one of these meetings in the University of Cape Town. And the mountain behind the building you may be able to make out are the foothills of Table Mountain. So the theme of my talk is that by looking at the tails of distributions of variables, which for me will be either blood pressure or plasma renin, we can learn a lot from these exceptions about what causes a disease and how we should manage it. There's been a debate for many decades in hypertension, which went under the name of Platt versus Pickering, as to whether hypertension is, quote, just the tail end of the distribution of blood pressure or whether it is a discrete entity. And it was widely thought that Pickering, who was a professor at St. Mary's many years ago, won this debate against Platt, who was a president of a college of physicians. But in the assumption that hypertension is the tail end of the distribution, it is easy to lose sight of the possibility that there may be discrete and very interesting variants whether rare or even relatively common. And I will be telling you about one of these, the causes of primary aldosteronism and individual molecular mutations which are behind this. Now, even if we argue about how many types of hypertension there are, and there are over a thousand genes now associated with hypertension, it's a simple rule of physics that pressure is force over area. And therefore, there must, to a degree, be a binary nature behind the nature of hypertension. And I like to illustrate this with the analogy of a garden hose and say that every gardener knows there are two ways that he can increase the jet of water coming out the end. One is to kink the end of the hose, which effectively is what the sprinkler does, and reduces the area. The other is to turn up the tap which effectively increases force. And it's not very different in the circulation. So around the time that these meetings were starting in the late 1990s, I was addressing what in those days was something of a heresy, the notion that not all drugs used for the treatment of hypertension were equally effective in every patient. And I conducted a study where a small number of young patients rotated in random order through each of the main drug classes. And somewhat to my surprise, I found that this young group of patients, on average, responded better to the drugs which work one way or another by blocking the renin system, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, than the drugs that work in a different way and cause a compensatory increase in renin. But the real interest, and as I've said, partly the theme of this talk, is that one can learn a lot more by looking at individual data, especially at the extremes of distribution, than at the means. And indeed, so heretical was the notion that patients respond differently to different drugs that the data found its way into the Lancet and even more persuaded them to roll out their color presses for one of the earliest color figures in the journal. And, and what this slide shows is that the blood pressure response to drugs follows a frequency distribution with some patients responding better than others to each of the four agents. And moreover, those who respond better to a drug which lowers renin, blocks the renin system in one way, for instance, this individual here, will also respond better to another drug which blocks the renin system, a beta blocker. And similarly, for the patients who respond better to drugs to a calcium blocker will also re respond better to a diuretic. And it was this data which spawned the ABCD rule following the serendipitous observation that these four drug classes start with the four, first four letters of the alphabet. Now this rule eventually came to underpin guidelines for treating hypertension but to a degree, its main influence nowadays is that the, the third stage of the rule, with most patients being encouraged to start on a combination of drugs which have complementary actions on hypertension, and the very last sentence 
that patients with resistant hypertension should be treated with spironolactone. And later on, I'll be showing you some evidence for this, which took us some 15 years to achieve. Now, the main distribution at whose tails I will be looking in this talk is the distribution of plasma renin. And this is real data which I gathered when we approached something like 850 patients in their general practices. And they came and had a blood test. And this is a histogram showing the number of subjects with a plasma renin of each level. And the two tails, one might call low renin and high renin hypertension, a term which had already been used for many years before I did this work. And the tail in which I'll be most interested today is the tail where plasma renin is low, because that is almost an infallible clue to the fact that this patient's hypertension is being driven by excess sodium. Infallible, that is, with one exception, which is the patient on a beta blocker, whom I've already told you beta blockers work by reducing blood pressure. I'm going to start, however, at the right-hand side with a couple of clinical examples because these are very easy to follow and show you some value of looking not just at low renal hypertension, but sometimes at the other end of the distribution. We wrote this paper in hypertension after seeing five patients who would presented with difficult hypertension and where the possibility that they had a renal artery stenosis had been dismissed because the initial imaging of the renal vasculature had been negative. And the message here is that if the plasma renin is extremely high at the extreme end of the distribution, do not take as absolute gospel the initial report you receive from the renal artery imaging. And I will just show you two of the five patients. The first was uh, a young woman who had, ha had hypertension for two years and was treated with two drug classes. The renin is in the thousands, almost a hundredfold greater than the normal range. And there's some secondary elevation of the aldosterone. The initial MR angiogram had been reported as normal, but at our multidisciplinary team meeting, the radiologist commented on the fact that the right kidney looked under compared to the left. So he offered to proceed forthwith to a direct renal angiogram with a view to performing angioplasty. If the suspicion was confirmed that there was an abnormality, you can indeed see that there was a tight stenosis in the right renal artery. And once the balloon catheter had been inserted, this was removed and the patient's blood pressure came down to completely normal off all treatment, and the renin has fallen almost a hundredfold. The second patient is also a, a young woman, this time with really severe hypertension, despite being treated with five classes, the first the four being ABCD plus an alpha blocker. My reason for choosing this patient is that she also illustrates once again how effectively the beta blockers suppress renin because it would be easy to look at this plasma renin and say, well, it's slightly high, but actually you should add at least one naught to the renin in a patient on a beta blocker, and that would make this renin not dissimilar to that in the first patient, again, with some secondary elevation of the aldosterone. Once again, this patient's CT angio had been reported as normal, but when this was reviewed at our MDT, especially when the radiologist reconstructed a coronal view, it was possible to see that there was a second renal artery with a, a stenosis at this point here. Once again, the radiologist proceeded to angioplasty, and once again, a very similar result to the first patient, with the renin falling well into the normal range, this time off treatment. So that is all I'm going to say about renin at the high end in this talk, and I'm now going to move to low renin and the condition primary aldosteronism. And this slide I used to define what is meant by primary aldosteronism, and it shows how renin is normally released from the kidneys, for instance, in response to salt depletion, and, and then acts through a series of steps to produce angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstrictor. And out of interest, I put the tap back on the slide so you can see the hypertension driven by 
a high renin would be the vasoconstrictor low force, low area type of hypertension. Angiotensin also acts on the adrenal glands to stimulate secretion of aldosterone. And if this is the dominant factor, then salt will be retained by the kidneys and the increased amount of circulating volume is equivalent to the high force type of hypertension. The condition about which I'm going to be speaking, primary aldosteronism, disconnects the renin from the aldosterone, usually due to the presence of a small tumour, benign tumour, in one of the adrenal glands. Here it is on the CT scan, here it is after it's been removed. Now this condition was first described in the 1950s by Jeremy Conn and for a long time was called Conn's syndrome. And what has happened in the interval? Well, undoubtedly, we've become better able to visualize much smaller tumors. Here's a, a recent one in our, our practice. And indeed, four centimeters is atypically large. There have been a number of procedures introduced which have changed matters since Jeremy Conn's time. But we have become somewhat stuck for the last 30 or 40 years. And it still requires a patient to have invasive investigations and treatment in order to achieve cure. And I sometimes contrast this with the situation for another half to one centimeter benign lesion, peptic ulcer, in which at the start of my medical career, patients were still having a whole stomach removed. We then progressed to vagotomy, and then the discovery of helicobacter led to the use of one or two tablets, a meprazole antibiotic, to cure patients without any need for invasive interventions. So over this time, we've learned that primary aldosteronism is a very common cause of hypertension, five to 10%. But what we have not increased is the proportion of patients who have actually been diagnosed. Robust data shows it's still fewer than 1% of all patients with this condition who are currently recognized and appropriately treated. Now, one of the consequences of this failure to recognize patients is that many, if they are diagnosed at all, present with so-called resistant hypertension or multiple drugs still above target. And it would be my and others' contention that resistant hypertension to a degree is synonymous with primary aldosteronism. And one of the things we can do using the concept of the distribution of renin is to demonstrate the shift that has occurred from a patient at the start of treatment to development of resistance. This slide here looks at data from one of three trials which I conducted together with colleagues in the British Hypertension Society a few years ago. And, and on this slide, we are plotting the fall in blood pressure against patients' plasma renin when they were treated in random order, firstly with an angiotensin blocker and then with a diuretic. And as the ABCD rule might predict, those who lied the left hand of the renin distribution respond better to diuretic, greater fall in blood pressure. Those who lie at the right hand side of the distribution respond better to an angiotensin blocker. And the point where these two lines cross is to the left of the median of the renin distribution. In other words, telling us that patients with untreated hypertension are relatively unlikely to have salt-dependent hypertension. There's more of the patients responding better to an angiotensin blocker than to a thiazide diuretic. When we look at the data from our pathway two trial, which was directed at resistant hypertension, I'll show you in a moment the response to spironolactone, but the key point at the moment is that where the, the lines cross for one drug which blocks the renin system and another which is a diuretic, this crossing point has now moved almost completely to the right hand of the renin distribution. In other words, the vast majority of people with resistant hypertension have salt-dependent salt hypertension and respond much better to a diuretic, at least spironolactone, than to a drug blocking the renin system. So while I'm here, let me tell you a bit about resistant hypertension and the evidence that it in part equates with primary aldosteronism. The Pathway 2 study 
bit like my ABCD rotation of the 1990s, was a rotation study, effectively a glorified crossover, where all patients have each of the treatments in random order. And in this case, the hypothesis was that spironolactone would be more effective than the alternatives. And this is exactly what we found. You now see blood pressure measured over several days at home, plotted against each of the four drugs. And compared to the placebo in the rotation, spironolactone is much more effective, both than placebo and than the two alternative active drugs. But as with the ABCD rotation, the real interest comes not just from looking at the mean data, but in looking at the individual data and extremes of the distribution. Here I've plotted the patient's plasma aldosterone against their plasma renin. And for reasons which will become apparent when I progress to the genotype part of my talk, I've separated the genders. And it's very interesting that for the males, instead of it being a linear relation between renin and aldosterone, at the left-hand end of the renin distribution, where aldosterone ought to be low because there's no renin driving it, you can see the aldosterone curve is going up again. In other words, suspicious that these patients include some with primary aldosteronism, whereas there's an absence of patients in this bottom left quadrant. So I'm going to look at one of these patients who is sufficiently suspicious to take through further investigation. A male in his 40s who participated in the study, good going hypertension despite being on four drugs. The initial investigations would not have made you that suspicious, except that I can tell you it's very rare for a patient with primary aldosteronism to have a sodium less than 140, and his potassium was towards the lower end of the range. His renin not completely suppressed, but relatively low, especially for someone on four drugs which ought to be elevating renin, and the aldosterone at the upper end of a normal range. During the rotation, we, no we noticed that he clearly responded better to one cycle of treatment than any of the others. Under the protocol, we were allowed to break the blind after each patient's termination of, the of the, their involvement in the study. When we did this, no great surprise, he's on spironolactone. So we were sufficiently suspicious to send him for a CT scan to look at his adrenal glands, and he has a small nodule in his right adrenal. He therefore underwent adrenal vein sampling in which a catheter is introduced into the two adrenal veins. We measure the concentration of the two steroid hormones and express them as a ratio. And you can see that there's much more aldosterone coming out of the right-hand side than the left. So the patient was referred to the adrenal surgeon on the most sophisticated measuring device of my old hospital. You can work out he's got roughly a half centimeter adenoma and after the removal of a gland, he described himself as feeling completely different, virtually normal blood pressure and normal biochemistry off all treatment. Some five years after Pathway, and there were over 300 patients recruited in five or six different centres, I think I'm right in saying he's the only person who's so far been investigated and treated. And to a degree, therefore, he illustrates the barriers to investigation and treatment, even when the suspicion might be high. Now, alongside this slow development of new techniques for changing the clinical world, there has been an explosion of understanding about what causes primary aldosteronism, largely at a molecular level, with our ability both to visualize the enzyme which makes aldosterone in the tissue once it's removed with very selective antibodies for the two enzymes, and something I'll be going on to talk to you about, development of a molecular probe for use in the patient, which homes in on the adrenal and allows us to see it. And it was this sort of technology which, together with genetic analysis, led us to realize that even the most commonly diagnosed type of adrenal adenoma secreting aldosterone is, is atypical in that at a microscopic level, it resembles more of the cells of the zona fasciculata to making cortisol in the normal adrenal than the more compact cells of the zona glomerulosa, which make aldosterone. In 2011, there was a landmark paper in Science from Rick Lifton's group in Yale reporting 
gain of function mutations in a potassium channel, KCNJ5. And these were present in some 40% of the tumors which he studied. And this made us suspicious that the tumors with these mutations were the classical cons tumor, classical but atypical in appearance. And therefore, we explored the mutations which might be present in the smaller tumors, which our PET CT scan were now beginning to recognize. And indeed, most of these turned out to have gain of function mutations either in a calcium channel or sodium potassium ATPase subunit. So the next stage of my talk is to ask how we can use some of these molecular probes to improve clinical management in the patients. And the main one I, I'm going to address is the PET-CT using a ligand that, if the patient is treated with dexamethasone, becomes highly selective for the aldosterone synthase enzyme. And we have just completed and reported a head-to-head -head study with the acronym of MATCH, funded by the NIHR, in which 140 patients had either, sorry, had both of metomidate PET-CT and adrenal vein sampling in random order. So here is the primary result. And this is presented initially by looking at the number of patients in the main analysis set, which was 126 patients for whom there was at least six months follow-up after surgery, who were deemed to be positive for unilateral disease on either one each of the two investigations in the blue and green squares, or on both of the investigations in the yellow square. And roughly two-thirds of all the patients were found to have unilateral disease, much higher than in routine practice, compared to 51 patients who were negative either on both investigations or on the PET-CT with a technical failure on the adrenal vein sampling. Now, the next bit of the slide is somewhat complex, so let me tell you what it shows first and then explain a little bit, which is to say that we were not sending more patients to surgery because of metomidate wrongly diagnosed unilateral disease. Out of 78 patients who went to surgery, 77 achieved at least one of the four primary outcomes which are now defined by international guidelines. These outcomes are divided into clinical, namely cure of hypertension, and biochemical, namely cure of primary aldosteronism, and each then further divided into complete or partial cure. So except for complete clinical cure, which means coming off all antihypertensive treatment and a blood pressure less than 135-85 at home, over 90% of patients achieved one or more of the other, other cures. And because the proportion of each of these three bars is roughly the same for blue, green, and yellow, what that means is that no one investigation was obviously more accurate than the other in predicting the outcome. And this is summed up in what's called the forest plot, in, in which the black squares are the, the mean difference in the accuracy of, of each treatment. And if these squares lie to the right of the zero line for any difference, they favor PET-CT. In other words, PET-CT was slightly more accurate than adrenal vein sampling. But if the confidence intervals around each of the squares crosses zero, then no one investigation is superior to the other. But if the confidence intervals do not cross the preset non-inferiority margin of 17%, we can and indeed do declare the metomidate PET-CT to be at least as good as adrenal vein sampling. So this is fantastic news that we have a non-invasive diagnostic which is almost as good as the, which, sorry, is at least as good as the invasive. One thing we've been able to do with the metomidate is to start considering whether we really need to take out the whole adrenal gland or can ablate the adenomas using radiofrequency ablation via the stomach. Now, when you f look at a CT scan in the axial view, at first sight, you would think that the left adrenal is a long way from the stomach with the pancreas in between. But if you turn your view sideways on in a sagittal view, in fact, the left adrenal sits very close to the stomach and there's almost always a clear path. And with Professor Steve Pereira at University College, we have been doing a study funded by the British Heart Foundation 
safety and efficacy assessment of endoscopic radiofrequency ablation with a needle going from the stomach into the left adrenal. And I'll show you the pictures of three patients who we've been able to follow out to six months after the ablation. And in each of these cases, the hot nodule that was ablated has disappeared from the post-ablation view. This is part of a normal adrenal that was already present at baseline. So I'm going to come now to the, the genotyping. And this takes me back to the, the first study, the MATCH study. And the first question is, of the various genes in which we and others found mutations a few years ago, what is their distribution in a prospective study? And are there differences between those who do well and those who do less well post-surgery? So here are the, the four main um, genotypes. And you look at their breakdown according to the ethnicity of the patient. And the messages are that in the white patients, the commonest mutation is the one discovered by Rick Lifton, the KCNJ5 mutation, whereas in the black patients, the calcium channel mutation, cacnade, is, is the predominant uh, uh, mutation. So do any of these predict the 30% or so who are able to come off all of their antihypertensive treatment after surgery? And, and the answer is one common and one new one, which I'll be telling you about. It's the patients with the KCNJ5 mutation who do well. If I take out of this distribution all those who are not completely cured, on the right-hand side, you can see we're mainly left with the KCNJ5 mutant and this new mutation in a G protein. And although most of the KCNJ5 patients are also women and are also in the younger age group, on a multiple regression analysis, it's strongly the genotype which predicts excellent outcome. And because evidence that we're now accruing with Professor Alt in Birmingham suggests that we can recognize this genotype by preoptive measurement of so-called hybrid steroids, there's a very good likelihood we'll be able to choose patients somewhat um, according to their likelihood of cure after surgery. Now, it's very important at this stage to say it doesn't mean we don't think the others should be treated because the main goal of surgery is not, in fact, to cure hypertension, but it's to protect the heart by suppressing the aldosterone in excess. And in this study, being prospective, we were able to measure the brain natural peptide, which most of you all know is a marker of cardiac, cardiac strain, and show that the very large fall in aldosterone, an average of 80% in patients who go to surgery, is paralleled by a large reduction in brain natural peptides. So we think this adds weight to the need to find and cure primary aldosteronism but it may be that the main use of the PET-CT scan will not be deciding who goes to surgery, but in choosing patients for ablation and to choose which nodule is ablated. So to finish, I want to say a few words about the new mutation, GNAQ. And this story goes back a few years to when we recognized three women presenting in pregnancy or menopause with a mutation in another gene called beta-catenin, CTNMB1. And we found that this mutation switched on very high levels in the tumor. This is a log scale of the receptor LHCGR for LH or HCG, the pregnancy hormone, explaining their presentation at times of high hormone levels. And these are the control patients with levels in the tumor less than the adjacent adrenal. But after that paper was published, we started to find many more patients presenting in pregnancy and they all had a second mutation in another gene, either the G-protein GNA11 or the very similar G-protein GNAQ. And this residue Q209 had been long recognized as the one to which the GTPase enzyme couples to G-proteins and is mutated, for instance, in many patients with other tumors, particularly uveal melanomas. And the clinical feature of this mutation in the G-protein, I won't go into most of it, detail in this table in our forthcoming article, but it shows that the blood pressure post-surgery in all 10 of a woman is not just normal, less than 135, but really normal off all treatments. So this is a, a genotype which, for reasons we speculate about, is associated with complete and really good cure. And the one of the reasons we, we know this gene is of interest 
is that if I take you back to one of my first slides about the renatogen system, the GNA11 or Q encode the G protein which mediates the aldosterone response to angiotensin. And in the test tube, we can show that if we transfect adrenal cells with the mutation, it causes a large increase in the amount of aldosterone being secreted. And the final bit of data is that in all 10 of these patients now, when we look at the level of receptor in their tumor, except for one patient, it is vastly higher than adjacent adrenal or in other tumors. And in, colleague, and, and in collaboration with Christina Znar in Paris, who had tumors which had a single CNMB1 mutation, but not the second mutation in GN11 or Q, we can see that this high LHCGR level is, is peculiar to patients with the double mutation. And, and this illustrates the, the excess of the LHCGR, not just at RNA level, but also a protein in the tumor in the same place as the tumor expresses the enzyme making aldosterone. When we transfect the mutation into adrenal cells grown from patients' tumors, then this is an example. This is one cell that's been transfected with both mutations, which when enlarged, you can see in red, it has turned on the receptor. And in multiple cells, the, qu the quantification of the data shows a, a similar large increase. So in summary, what I've shown you is the value of looking at exceptions. Exceptions matter. Primary aldosteronum causes a large proportion of hypertension, but currently is recognized in very few. In order to make diagnosis and treatment more available, we are developing non-invasive or minimally invasive techniques. And looking slightly further ahead, I've shown you some evidence that we should be able to stratify by the genotype of the tumor and the surrogates measurable prior to surgery and suggest that rather than conventional anatomical subtyping between, right, uh, between unilateral and bilateral disease, we will start to choose the nature of intervention according to molecular rather than anatomical distinctions. And finally, and further off in the future, I think the omeprazole of primary aldosteronism may come about when we are able to inhibit aldosterone production and stimulate aldosterone synthesizing cells to become apoptotic. So I'd like to acknowledge a very large number of people in different places, clinical and laboratory, who have contributed to the story which I've told you. Thank you. Thank you.